All right, folks. Well, we want to get back into our bottom-up parsing, and we said that this time around we would look at a table-driven approach. So what we're going to use are two tables that we'll call an action table and a go-to table. And these are basically specifying what it is we want to do next in terms of a shift reduce, right? What rule we want to apply or what, uh, what we want to push on our stack, what we want to pop off the stack and replace with something else. And then the go-to is going to keep track of what new state of our derivation we should jump to. So somewhere behind the scenes, there's going to be this kind of abstract idea of a, of a DFA that's keeping track of our possible states and where we can go to from our current state. So the action is going to be associated with what we do during that transition, and the go-to is going to be associated with which states we jump to and under what conditions. So we'll look at the algorithm to use these, and then we'll start looking at how you would go about actually constructing these tables. And that's where life is going to get interesting. All right, so this is going to be another stack-based algorithm, uh, another of our LRs. So we're going through our tokens left to right, and we're assuming a rightmost derivation. And the language-specific details for the thing we're trying to parse are going to be contained within this action table and this go-to table. So we'll use the stack to keep track of the stack of states that we've been going through during the deri derivation. And basically each one kind of reflects where we are in our derivation frontier, you know, what we've transformed so far and still have left to process. I guess more of what we've still got left to process based on where we've gotten so far. So again, for each combination of our current state and some next input, the action table identifies what we're going to do in terms of either a shift, pushing something new on the stack, or a reduce, what to pop off and replace. And then the go-to table is going to look at our state and some non-terminal that we're going to actually apply a reduce to, for instance, and look at what our next state should be. So we're going to look at ways to automatically generate the action and go-to tables based on the grammar rules for the language. So the algorithm itself, first off, again, assuming that we've got these tables magically produced, is we're going to go through and uh, we'll use a variable A to keep track of the, the input word that we're processing right now. And we're just going to keep going until done, until either we hit an accept state or we hit an, a state where it's impossible to proceed. So assuming that S is the current state on the top of the stack, we want to look up in that action table, what do I do with that state and input combination? If it tells us we're supposed to shift something, then we'll push whatever that is, and then read the next input symbol and use that as our new value for A. So we look up in the action table, if it's a shift, this is what we'll do. Otherwise, if it's a reduce, we'll do something else. If it's an accept, something else. And if it's a reject, we'll do something else. So if the action table says we're supposed to reduce, then it's going to tell us what we're supposed to reduce to, which of the grammar rules we're supposed to be applying here. So what we'll do is figure out how many symbols there are. So if you know A goes to, a, B, to X, Y, Z, for instance, then we want to pop three things off of the stack and replace them with a state that corresponds to our x. So we'll pop some symbols off of the stack. We'll look up what's, what state is now on top of the stack. So after we pop those things, look at what state we're in on the stack there. And in the go-to table, we'll look up from that state and this new left-hand side non-terminal, what state should we wind up in? So this is where the go-to table tells us what our new state should be. And again, if we're kind of building our parse tree, uh, we should construct that based on the, the rule we just applied. Or if we're just outputting the derivation sequence, again, we should output that at this point. Right? Whatever bookkeeping we're doing should take place here. So we've got the possibility of a shift or a reduce. Or it's, the possi it's possible that we've actually hit the our top uh, non-terminal, if you'd like, and it's time to accept. So if our combination of state and uh, whatever's next in the input is accept, we'll just break and say, ah, great, we did it, we're done. And if it's anything else, it's going to represent some form of error, 
right? If, if, if action doesn't tell us to shift and it doesn't tell us to reduce and it doesn't tell us we're in an accept state, then something's gone wrong. So we'll just keep going until either we accept or we hit an error. But again, this all relies on having these two functional tables that work for the grammar that we want. And again, for any possible state and input combination, the action table is supposed to tell us whether we're supposed to do a shift, and if so, what, or reduce, and if so, what. And meanwhile, for any possible state and non-terminal combination, the go-to table is supposed to tell us what our new state is supposed to be. And we'll be pushing that on the stack. So this is the information we want in those two tables. We just have to figure out a way to populate them. So to do this, what we're going to do is kind of implicitly build a deterministic machine that keeps track of the states that we're in and what happens when we transition between them. So this is going to reflect every possible state that the top of our stack could be in. And it's going to represent the transitions between them based on what we see next in our input characters or in our input sequence. So for these different conditions that the top of state can or top of stack can be in, we can sort of look at our grammar rules and get an idea of what those might represent. So if you've got a rule like s goes to x, y, then the state we could be in in terms of deriving that rule would be either, you know, if we're working on an s, we could be either right before the x, right after the x, or right after the y. Right? Similarly, if we're working on an x rule, we could be right before the, the a, right after the a, right after the x, or right after the b. Or we could be right before, or right after the c. Or for the y rule, we could be right before the d, right after the d, or right after the e. So we've got these different ideas of what the top of the stack could look like for these different rules. Now, it's also possible that there are additional considerations based on how we got to this s or x or y uh, if you like the um, the, pro the part of the derivation that got us here. So we'll consider those shortly. But again, we would go through and come up with a list of all of the, the different states that we could be in. And somehow our DFA has to at least model these things. And again, we'll introduce other states as we go through. All right, so what we want to do is keep track of this idea of what derivation are we working on, right? What rule are we working on? Where are we in it, and what's the next character that we're interested in? So the whatever what could come after this rule if this rule is successful. So for instance, if our top of stack reflects that we're working on this you know, the, the state that we're in and represents this idea that we're working on the A rule where A goes to B, C, D, and we've seen the B and the C, and we're expecting an x to follow the BCD. So the notion is that we've got this, we've, we've nailed down the, the B and the C part so far. We need to see the stuff for D next, and then we're expecting to see an X after the D. After we finish the D, the next thing in line should be an X. So this is what our, uh, our pairs are going to represent. And we're going to be working with these pairs as we're pushing stuff on the stack. So the derivation that we're working on, where are we are in it, and what should be coming afterwards. So if I have something like A goes to you know the dot first and then our B, C, D, or whatever, followed by an X, that implies that we think that this is a possible rule to apply. You know, we think that there, there is a chance that this is the right rule. And again, if we're following the ideas of look ahead, you know, we've looked at what the next character is, that x, and figured out, ah, okay, this is probably where we should be going. So if we've seen something like a, or if our current state reflects that a goes to bcd, and we've seen the bcd, and we're expecting an x next, that would mean that if there is actually an x next in the input, this was the right rule. We can complete this production, right? We got all the way through b, c, and d, and we're seeing the right thing afterwards, so this actually worked. So you've got the idea of, we think this, is, is a, this rule is a, a possibility. You know, this rule actually works if the next thing is an x. 
or that we're partway through the process where we've seen some of it and we know what we're expecting, but we haven't checked yet to see if the stuff that's coming up actually matches a D and is followed by an X. So these are the, the kind of, this is the notation that we're going to be using. And so what we want to do is we'll build up this deterministic machine one state at a time. So we'll have our start state and we'll talk about how we set up that start state. And then just one chunk at a time, we'll look at, well, you know, based on whatever's next in the input, what states can we get to from the one that we're in right now? And we're just going to build this up one at a time. Every time we see a state that we've never seen before, we'll add it to our DFA and update the transition tables for our DFA and keep track of all of the information for this. And eventually we'll hit the point where we can't add any more states, where every transition that we can see is to some state that we already have. And at that point, our DFA will be complete and we can use it to generate our action and go-to tables. All right. So to go through this process of incrementally building our DFA, we're going to make use of two more functions. Uh, a go-to function, and it's not to be confused with our table earlier, um, and a closure function. So the go-to is going to identify transitions, and the closure is going to uh, essentially find all the different ways that we could get to an equivalent state to the one that we're in now, or an equivalent string to the one that we're in now, we're using now. So for the go-tos, it's basically saying, okay, well, looking at our current state or looking at a current state and a symbol, what's the new state we can get to? And then the closure is going to look at a state and say, well, what are all the equivalent ways that we could get here? So for the closure, if I've got something like a rule S goes to, you know, X and we're, we've seen the X, we're expecting a Y and a Z, and it's all supposed to be followed by uh, a token X. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't have used a non-terminal X or, a, a, or non-terminal X and a terminal X, but um, or token X. So we've got this derivation rule that we're working on, and we're partway through it. And you know whatever character we're expecting to see afterwards. This would mean that you know if we see a Y and then a Z. You know, whatever y boils down to, whatever z boils down to, and then an x, this is the right rule. This, this production rule works. So this means that this rule works, but if you think about it, then also anything that could act as y would also work here. So any string that reduces to y would work in this place. So closure is based on this idea of saying, okay, well, you know, y would work here, but anything that could get us to a y would also work here. So it's just finding all those other things that could get to a y. All right, so let's look at those two functions. So um, our go to. So again, what we're going to have is go to expects a state and a symbol, and it's going to tell us what our new state should be. So again, our states are going to be represented as sets of rules that all take us to kind of this equivalent place where I've got a whole bunch of rules of some non-terminal goes to you know some point in our derivation and is followed by some character. So I'll have a whole bunch of these different things. A will be some grammar symbol, right? A token or a non-terminal. And go to is just figuring out where we can get to from there. So the way we'll work go to is to say for each of these things that's in our state s so for each of these different rules and sort of derivation points that we're working on i want to see if it's got the right form for us so if it's of the form you know x goes to something dot a right where the next thing to process the next thing we're expecting is the symbol that we're actually seeing right now if that's the case, if the rule that we're looking at right now has that form, right, where we've got something that we've already processed, a dot, and then our symbol next, then I'm going to add a new result that says, okay, well, I in that case, I can actually, since I'm seeing that symbol next, and I'm expecting that symbol next, I can go to the state that's right after that. So essentially, I can say, okay, well, I can process that A and be done. And so we're adding this new state that basically says, okay, well, my next state would be just having processed that A. 
And so we're just going through this set of rules looking for all of the ones that are suitable for that A. And once we've got that set, then we have to figure out all of the other equivalent ways that we could have gotten there. So this is where we're going to call closure on that set to go through and say, okay, now expand it with all of the other things that could have gotten us there. So the closure, again, we're expecting this set of a bunch of rules where we've got, you know, some non-terminal goes to you know, some right-hand side combination of tokens and non-terminals. And right now we're at some specific point in it and we're expecting some character afterwards. Right, so we've got this set that we've been given and we want to find all of the things that could equivalently get us there. So the algorithm is basically going to be keep going, adding things to S until we can't find anything more to add. So we'll look through each element in the set and you know it's going to have some process where we've got you know, non-terminal goes to whatever, 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 and we're at some current point in it and some symbol expected next. And then for anything that's a non-terminal right after the dot, right? So any non-terminal that that's supposed to come next for this rule, we want to look at each of the production rules for that non-terminal. So, you know, if, if C is the non-terminal that's next, then all of the different rules that say C goes to whatever. We want to figure out essentially what could come right after the C. So we're going to look up, if you remember our first and follow sets, we want to look up all of the things that could be the first character in dx, right? We're expecting this rule to go C and then whatever D is and then an X should be next. So the first character, the first token in that dx would be the thing that comes right after C. So for everything that can come right after C, we're going to add a rule that says, okay, well, we could have our C goes to whatever that right-hand side is, so the dot and then the right-hand side. So this is reflecting what C could go to next. And then we're reflecting the fact that right after that, we should see that character F. So we're just expanding all of the different things that could be a valid way to get to where we are right now. Right, all the different ways we could expand that next non-terminal to get to an equivalent condition. So this is the algorithm, right? We've got our go-to, we've got our closure, we plug those into our DFA algorithm, and we can actually generate the deterministic machine. And based on that, we can generate the two tables that we need to encode the information from the DFA. So construction algorithm, uh, we've got our start state. We're actually going to throw an extra state around this, an extra state into our grammar, or an extra rule into our grammar, rather, to, uh, to support this kind of paired idea. So if S is the top non-terminal in our grammar, then really what we're expecting is S followed by kind of the end of the string. So we'll add this new outer pair, if you like, that says our new S can go to our proper grammar S. So we're starting before it, we expect to see S, and then we should see the end of the input there, just so that we can get this um, idea of capturing where the input has to end. So this set is going to be, if you like, our starting point for our start state in the DFA. We're going to take the closure of that to get all the equivalent ways that we could express that start state. And that will be our C0 for our deterministic machine. And we're going to build up this set of states of all the states in the deterministic machine. And right, we'll start off with that one. And we'll just keep adding states until we can't add any more, until everything that we see is something we've already seen. So for every state that we haven't already processed in all, you can kind of think of that as a to do as yet another to-do list. So for every state that we haven't processed yet, that we've added to all but haven't processed yet, we'll mark it as processed, so I'll take it out of our to-do list, for instance. And then for every symbol that comes right after the dot in every one of the rules in that state, 
we want to figure out where we could go to from that state and symbol and update that as our transition function entry for our deterministic machine. Right? We've got this state that we're interested in and we're saying if I'm in this state and I see this, this is, this is where I want to go. And then we add that as our new state in all, or as a new state in all, if we haven't already seen it. Again, if we've already seen it, we don't need to, to add it to all over and over and over again. And we're just going to keep going through this process, seeing if we can get to someplace new, right? Go to is telling us where that should be, seeing if we can get to someplace new. And if we can, we add it. And remember that we have to process it later, right? Throw it in a to-do list. And we just keep going until we have no more states to add to our DFA. That. Yeah. So again, uh, these CI states represent all of the different equivalent derivations for what the current top of the stack could be and how we got there. Go to is telling us where we can go to next, and the closure is identifying all of the equivalent ways to get there. So this works. It is brutal to do by hand, right? If you've got a a uh, language, a grammar of any significant size at all, this is a long error-prone process to go through by hand. So this is where, again, it's so natural to program something to do this for us, right? This is the, the logical way to, to tackle things. And if you're looking at having an auto-generated parser that works bottom-up, this is the approach that you're going to take. Now, if you're not trying to come up with a, a hand-coded bottom-up parser, this is the approach that you're going to typically going to follow, is spend a considerable amount of time debugging your, uh, um, your constructions for the action and go-to tables. But once you've got those, again, it's once you've debugged your creation algorithms, this is a, a very natural way to go. And again, for tools, this is going to be a pretty common approach for them to, to go through. But obviously, the, the debugging process for creating these tools is a relatively nasty one, right? Because you've got to get this right, because those action and go-to tables have to be correct. Otherwise, your, uh, the parser that you're generating from them is not going to be right for the language that you give it. So they have to be correct, but there is, again, clearly a lot of detail going into these. And when you're trying to debug them, you have to have your test cases and you have to have your own verification of what you're expecting from those test cases. So it is a, a tricky process, but this is what a, an automated bottom-up parser generator is going to look like. All right, we will leave that one there for now.